Do you want to change the world? So do I. On this show, we meet artists whose work is doing just that. Welcome to Art Heals All Wounds. I'm your host, Pam Uzel. My mother was the second to youngest of seven children. Both my brother and I were adopted when my parents were in their 30s, which at that time was fairly old for people to start a family. Those two things combined meant that I had lots of cousins on my mom's side who were way, way older than me. My mom's oldest sister was, I think, 18 or so when my mom was born, and even her youngest children were at least 18 years older than I was. When I was about five, we were visiting my mom's family, staying with my grandmother as we always did, and lots of cousins were over. One was a younger cousin about my age, the daughter of one of my first cousins. But there were three older cousins, young men, who were in their early 20s. I was enamored of these cousins. In my eyes, they were so dashing and handsome, and I immediately developed major cousin crushes on them. The best thing about them was that being young and without kids of their own yet, They were still fun. I loved being chased, and I remember them chasing me and this other cousin around and around the house and the yard that day. And if they caught one of us, they would do that thing where they grabbed us by the forearms and swung us around until our legs lifted off the ground and it felt like flying. That was so fun. When I became a parent myself, I read that you weren't supposed to do that to kids because it could cause their arms to come out of their sockets. Well, I must have been swung around like that at least a dozen times that day, with no injuries, no arms coming out of my sockets. I don't know exactly when this next thing happened, but I was still young, like in elementary school. One day my mom told me that one of those cousins was going to prison. He had been arrested for dealing drugs. My parents brought my grandmother back to live with us to get her away from what they considered a bad environment, and I never saw any of those cousins again. And we never talked about the one that went to prison. It was as if he had been erased from our lives entirely. I just accepted it, and to be honest, I didn't think about him much anymore. At some point, when I was a teenager, My mom told me that he had died of a heroin overdose, and I just couldn't reconcile that in any way with the memory of this young guy who had swung me around and around and around that day. I haven't thought about this story for a long time until I began talking with the guest on today's episode. Rigo 23, a painter, muralist, and activist, has undertaken collaborative art projects with some of America's political prisoners. In fact, talking with Rigo 23 was what inspired me to do a mini-series on belonging this season. My cousin wasn't a political prisoner. I'm pretty sure that he went to prison for dealing marijuana. We closed the door on so many people on that side of the family after that, so I don't know when he began using heroin, but I've always imagined that it was after serving time. I wondered what it was like for him to cross that border from being outside to inside, then to outside again. The brilliance of Rigo 23 is certainly in his artistic ability, but also in his compassion and empathy. His work asks us to remember those members of our community, of our families who are behind bars, Can we reimagine a justice system that doesn't rely so heavily on incarceration? And how do artists on either side of the divide of prison walls work in collaboration to help us to reimagine alternatives to mass incarceration? Rigo 23 
the sixth artist of the Agents of Belonging miniseries, is asking us to see these collaborative works and remember the person on the other side of the wall. Thank you so much for listening to this special episode of the Agents of Belonging miniseries. If you like what you're hearing, please follow us on your favorite listening app and share us with a friend. Ricardo Govea was born and raised on the island of Madeira, which is now an autonomous region of Portugal. As a teenager, he came to California to live with relatives in the small town of Patterson in the San Joaquin Valley. Eventually, his cousin Frank invited him to come to San Francisco to live. After visiting local art schools, he applied to the San Francisco Art Institute. He also began calling himself Rigo, with various numbers indicating years afterward, beginning with Rigo 85 in 1985, and finally in 2003, adopting the name Rigo 23, which he's used ever since. There's so much I could talk to Rigo about in terms of his art career. If you've ever come to San Francisco and been enchanted by the murals in the Mission District, he's one of the founding artists behind the Clarion Mural Project. He's also the creator of many examples of pop art in San Francisco. But the piece of art that drew me to his story was his larger-than-life statue of political prisoner Leonard Peltier. Leonard Peltier is the longest serving political prisoner in the United States. I'll provide links to more info on Leonard Peltier in the show notes if you haven't heard of his case. This statue of Leonard Peltier was based on a self-portrait done by Peltier from prison. I became interested, maybe a bit obsessed, with the story of the statue when it was stolen, then recovered last winter. I attended an exhibit last March called February 31st, which highlighted Rico 23's collaborative work with the Angola 3. I left with so many questions I wanted to ask Rico. I wanted to know more about his collaborations with those who are incarcerated. And I wanted to learn how these collaborative works absorb and redirect our attention to those who have been forgotten behind bars. Hi, Rigo. Thank you so much for being on Art Heals All Wounds. Can you start by telling us who you are and what you do? Certainly, Pam. It's great to be here with you and uh, your listeners. My name is Rigo. I sign my artwork as Rigo23. I'm originally from an island in the Atlantic called Madeira Island, which is uh, geographically closest to Northern Africa, but culturally and politically is a Portuguese island. I recently saw your February 31st show at the Anglum Trimble Gallery in San Francisco. And that's where I started really getting the idea of how much of your work is actually collaboration. And I think that that's how you describe a lot of your work as well. And Can you talk just a little bit about what the February 31st show was? The February 31st refers to a point in space and time which is not available to us if we are to use only mainstream points of reference. In other words, we all know that the month of February is supposed to have either 28 or 29 days. If we look into that, And I know that's not what we are here to do, but the fact that every four years, that the number of days in the year has to be corrected and all that has to do with this patriarchal deviation from the natural cycles that occur in nature. The fact that February is the shortest month of the year and that in the United States, that month has been chosen as the African-American History Month is the result of a series of constructs that 
are inherently oppressive, you know, namely women and people of African descent in this country. So the three individuals that became known as the Angola Three, with whom I've been collaborating over the last two decades, are the inspiration or the departure point for that exhibit. That exhibit is a bit of um, almost like a diaristic portrait of some of what has been going on in that two decade long relationship or uh, with them. And the point that I was trying to make with the title is that when you are in the company in, of these men or in communication with them, which now Robert King is the only one who's still alive, the other two are sadly no longer here, that when you are with them, that February has 31 days and that in fact, every day is February 31st because you are inhabiting a realm of possibility and aspiration and uh, conquest, as it were, in the good sense of the word, meaning that we are able to go there because they they take us to the 31st day of February. Right. Well, I really want to unpack that a little bit because it's a really interesting concept. First of all, for people who don't know the other members of the Angola Three, can you name all three of them? So everyone who's listening knows who we're talking about. And also not to put this burden on you, but just briefly who they were and why they were imprisoned. The Angola Three were, the name Angola derives from the penal institution where they were confined to Angola, Louisiana State Prison. And Angola refers to this culture geography in Africa which is now the country of Angola, and it was a Portuguese colony for centuries. They became independent and sovereign in 1975. And these three men, they were organizers within prison. They um, fought for the betterment of conditions in prison, namely trying to prevent or disrupt the culture of sexual slavery that happened in the prison but also wow. advocating for a more humane treatment. They did not want, as they say, they did not want to beautify them. But given that that was the space, the situation they were confined to, they were determined to fight for their rights, even within an extreme context of deprivation. And there they were Herman Wallace, Albert Wood Fox, and Robert King. Mm. They came in contact with the ideology of the Black Panther Party in the late 1960s, soon after the Black Panther Party was established in Oakland. And eventually they opened a chapter of the Black Panther Party within Angola prison. Mm -hmm. And because they were quite successful in doing that, at one point they had you know hundreds of members of this prison chapter of the Black Panther Party, they became targets for further punishment from the administration of the prison and ultimately were accused of the the death of a white guard that they clearly had nothing to do with, but because they were the most visible organizers within the prison, they were, quote-unquote, taken out and um, selected for further punishment because of that. So they were were put in what what amounts to solitary confinement, is a type of punitive incarceration within a prison. Um, and Angola, they refer to that system or that designation as CCR, closed cell restricted. So you are restricted literally to the inside of a six by nine by 12 foot cell or a minimum of 23 hours a day. Wow. That one hour that you might get out of the cell, most of the time, you just get access to the corridor, what they call the tier, which basically is a space of eight cells. One cell has been adapted into a shower. So you get an hour out of the cell, 15 of those minutes, you get to take a shower. And the other 45 minutes you can use to walk up and down the corridor and quote unquote visit with the other inmates by positioning yourself in front of their cell and that way being able to talk to them. Mm. They endured those conditions collectively for 114 years. 
That's unbelievable. I really now want to talk about this idea of collaboration. So many people listening to this would say, well, how can you possibly collaborate with people who are more or less in solitary confinement most of the time? So I would love to hear, first of all, when you pivoted to this idea, when did this occur to you that you could have collaboration and how did you do it? Well, the pivotal event, I think, was soon after my parents purchased a television in Portugal in 1974, you know, there, there was only one channel. It was black and white TV. There was only one channel that operated, um, I don't know, many hours out of the day. It wasn't 24 hours. And then there was another sort of cultural channel that operated for fewer hours. And early on in the history of our family owning a TV set, they were showing images on TV of this man leaving prison in Portugal. And I now understand that they were political prisoners in Portugal that had fought against. We had a sort of a fascist regime there that lasted for nearly half a century. And my father was watching the television evening news with the family. It was four of us. And he started to weep as he was watching the TV. And I had never seen my father cry not even when his father died. I was five years old when my grandfather died. And uh, my parents, of course, took me to the funeral, but I did not see my father crying then. And then I see him crying in front of the TV. And on the television, there's the image of this man with like long hair, kind of oily hair and beards. In other words, it didn't look anything like my father who was a you know, postal worker, you know, very mainstream kind of guy. But I was completely dumbfounded to see him crying. So I turned to my mom, like for an explanation and like this kind of helpless gaze. And she said, you know, Let, it's okay, just leave him alone. It's okay, that is okay, just leave him alone. With the passing of the years, this had a profound impact on me. So when I moved to Lisbon to go to school, there were people who were incarcerated still for political reasons. This was in the mid 80s. And my brother and I and a group of us went and visited them um, in prison. And when I come to California, living in San Francisco, going to art school on the SF Weekly, a publication that no longer exists, I believe, there was a small article about Geronimo Gijaga, who was a member of the Black Panther Party and had been in prison in California for a very long time and was considered by many to be a political prisoner. So I was taken aback and sort of shocked by this. Like, how could there be political prisoners in California that, you know, those things mm -hmm. don't happen here? And that led to my making art tribute to Geronimo and then eventually started corresponding with him. He was at Mule Creek State Prison. And this had a profound impact on me as well, just, because in my estimation and, and de facto, these were sort of larger-than-life figures, individuals who were part of American history, and I had no idea that as a foreigner, as a kid, that I could write a letter and they would write me back. Right. So that led to an interest in other people who were in a similar situation, which eventually led me to the Angola tree. So I was aware of them not long before the first member was released, Robert King. And he was released on February 8th, 2001. He was released partially due to the efforts of a young person. He might, have, he might even have still been a law student at the time in Berkeley, Scott Fleming. Mm -hmm. Or he had just gotten his degree and the case was so wrought with, um, you know, procedural mistakes and namely like he, Robert King had been uh, tried by a juror that was made entirely of white men and that was a constitutional violation. So he was able to get a redress and was ultimately released. So I met Robert King a couple months after he was released, which was remarkable. He was released on February 8th, and I met him that April. Wow. And you can imagine <laughs> having a pretty, you know, sheltered uh, lifestyle. Both my parents were postal workers, and we lived on a small island. 
very little crime, very little sort of violent crime. Um, so incarceration on Madeira is probably counted in months, you know. Right. So to meet someone that had spent 29 and a half years in solitary confinement, it just you know tested my capacity to imagine a life different than my own. Right. And then encountering the person that I did in Robert King at that time, like the extent to which he appeared to be whole and the absence of anger, the absence of desire for vengeance. Like it was just, um, you know, for me, it was like having access to potentially a, a you know, really top notch. <laughs> teacher no like master kind of. so i cling to that relationship without trying to impose myself but it, i felt like i was also welcomed pretty close to him um so soon thereafter we were traveling together i invited him to come to portugal which he accepted and yeah we traveled to several countries and basically i just couldn't get enough of watching him interact with other people listening to what he had to say Never, it was never a voyeuristic thing about life in prison. Um, Robert King actually doesn't talk much about that. Mm -hmm. It was more about who he had been able to become and what his worldview was. I feel like something about that worldview must have shaped yours and also this idea of becoming a collaborator with other political prisoners. Is that true? It is. Part of my attraction to come here was to sort of see firsthand, see for myself what life was truly here, you know, because going back to that early stages of my parents having a TV before my family purchased a television, they, my father rented one for the weekend because it was kind of a sizable investment. Mm -hmm. to buy the TV and you want to make sure that it was a sound <laughs> thing to do. So he rented a television for a weekend. We had a slumber party at my maternal grandmother's apartment. And when he turned the TV on, Bonanza came on. You know, Cowboys and Indians. So just the reach of American pop culture really cannot be underestimated. And in, in a lot of like peripheral markets, what happens is like local broadcasters and whatnot they purchase older output from the united states so you know an eight-year-old boy in the 1970s by me watching a show from the 1950s you know <laughs> so i came here partially because i wanted to see get a different perspective that i knew was not gonna show up on the tv set over there so Meeting somebody like Robert King, it was a perspective on American life that was so far away from, quote unquote, the rat race, the mainstream, the main lane, right? Um, right. This notion that everybody is heading towards the same goal, that everybody wants the same thing, and that um, success is measured on who can get there faster. Right. Um, the so called. Um, rat race so i knew i did not want to participate in that race and i think just stopping not moving you can see the crowd quote unquote go by and in that alone you can learn a lot but i feel that all of suddenly i had access to the perspective of this individual who had been not only excluded from the rat race but confined against his will every single day to this cell 23 hours a day so what could uh, the perspective on life be for someone like that so that was you know, like staring at an abyss it was like irresistible for me to try and, and learn from his perspective and what he had the wisdom he and they had accumulated from that most unique of points and um you know to my surprise i came to realize that he appreciated the dialogue, you know. One thing that I think is so important about your work is that it's showing a perspective that is hidden from so many mainstream Americans. You're amplifying something 
that either doesn't or may not occur to us because we're also seeing those 1950s reruns of Bonanza in a certain way. Right. I first started feeling compelled to reach out to you and ask you to come on the show and talk about your work because of the story that I read about the statue you'd made of Leonard Peltier. So I'm wondering if you can do two things, tell the story of what happened with that statue, but then I want to go back and hear about how you met Leonard Peltier and your relationship with him. So would you mind telling the story? First of all, what is the statue of Leonard Peltier? So this statue is a collaboration of sorts. Is a again, a unique take on the notion of collaboration because it's between two artists because Leonard identifies as an artist as well. He paints from prison. Two artists that are in very different um, life circumstances and who actually cannot mingle, cannot spend time together physically. Mm -hmm. So I, there was one particular painting that Leonard made of himself, a self-portrait. He has done a, a few. But this one I found particularly striking because he was, he depicted himself sitting on the floor of his cell and his body position was very similar to Rodin's The Thinker, you know, except that Rodin, you know, depicts this, you know, muscular sort of epic male sitting on a pedestal, brooding, and Leonard portrays himself not on a pedestal, sitting on the floor. He's not naked, showing off his impeccable anatomy. He's wearing clothes that he didn't get to choose. Uh, Prison-issued clothing. Mm -hmm. so he has his like, yellow, orangey pants and a white shirt. And then on what would be the window on the cell, the bars have kind of melted away. And he depicts a hawk flying in the distance. And he says, you know, my body might be in prison but my spirit soars um, like an eagle or soars like a hawk so i was first you know impressed by the painting by the way he had chosen to depict himself and then you know just inhabiting public space as i like to do urban space i noticed i couldn't help but notice the absence of the representation of contemporary native american life in public statuary Mm -hmm. except for the, you know, cigar store Indian chief. Right. Which is a racial stereotype, and it's an anonymous chief that's usually chained to the some kind of public furniture at the store so people won't steal the, mm -hmm. the statue. So I wanted to introduce into public space a statue that, formerly had similar, you know, Leonard is not classically trained as a painter. He's a self-taught painter. I'm not trained as a sculptor. So I was interpreting his painting, basically going from a two-dimensional representation to a three-dimensional representation. But then I enlarged it in scale too. I rendered him roughly the size of the space he gets to inhabit, a nine by six by 12 foot cell. And my idea was to make this sculpture available for acts of solidarity with with Leonard's plight. You know, Leonard is known the world over or what it represents, you know, which is the imprisonment of Native American grievances or leadership that speaks of the collective grievances of these many different cultures that inhabit this geography. That's kind of what drew me to him, the fact that he made art as a way to kind of retain his sanity in prison, as a way to negotiate his um, current condition with the world. And I could say that in a way, that's also why I make art, or why a lot of artists make art as a way to deal with this experience of, you know, being a sentient being for a short period of time and having this vertigo of this possibility that you can make objects or things that can outlive you <laughs> or, or that people can interact with your impressions of life without having to interact with you personally you know right um, so in a way 
Leonard was making art for the very same reason that I make art, but under extremely different circumstances. You know, he makes art with commissary issued materials, you know, like pre stretched little canvases of poor quality and, you know, paints that are also the ones that he can get a hold of. And then for him to paint, he has to have access to, I imagine, occupation room. I don't know what they call it in prison. I know that he also made furniture. But yeah, it was again this idea of like, can art bring individuals that have very different life experiences together in the production of a common thing, mm -hmm. a common entity, a common object, or a common uh, common um, moment? And and initially, what I actually started doing was just plainly exhibiting Leonard's artwork. There was an exhibition in San Francisco at the De Young Museum in 1999 as the museum was getting ready to close, to be demolished and the new building be built. And Glenn Helfand, a curator and thinker around contemporary art from the Bay Area, he organized this exhibition where he asked Bay Area artists to envision what was called museum pieces and envision what the museum could slash should be like for the 21st century versus the 20th century. And the De Young is one of those institutions that has a collection that's organized by geographical areas. So they had quite a few Native American artifacts, but there were artifacts that are preserved and in a way extricated from the continuity of time, as if these cultures had existed, were very valuable, but at some point, there's just a total disconnect. We don't know whether they still exist or not, what's happening with them, what they are doing, what they are they striving for. Right. So there was basically a question I posited was, how can an institution of knowledge be so interested and value so much the past of a culture yet seems so detached from the current condition of that same culture. So I suggested that the Young Museum should have a whole other museum within that architecture called Tate Wikikwa Museum. And Tate Wikikwa in Lakota, I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but stands for the wind chases the sun. And that's a name that Leonard was given by Lakota elders. So my participation in that exhibition in 1999 was to create a museum that would be entirely dedicated to Leonard Peltier, his art and his life's plight. And that's where this started. This what evolved into this statue of Leonard Peltier. I mounted different iterations, diff different variations of that Tatewe Kiko Museum. And in 2011, at Syracuse University, the opportunity came up to do a sculpture as part of the exhibition. Mm -hmm. So that's when I first made a 3D version of the painting, and it was not freestanding. The sculpture was kind of protruding out of the wall, so it didn't have the back, just had from the shoulders forward. And I worked with two Korean-American women students there that were in the ceramic department. So we got and fired clay and together did the feet, the forearms, the head, the portrait of Leonard, and the rest of the body was just made up with this haphazard materials. Um, so that's how the, the statue began. And, and it was meant to be just temporary for that exhibit alone. But because, but because it was in Syracuse, some of the visitors that came for the opening and included um, Oren Lyons, who was a great leader of the Iroquois Confederation on, of East Coast mm -hmm. tribes. He was the first person that spoke at the United Nations General Assembly in December of 1991, when they, were, when they decided, December of 1992, rather, when they decided that 1993 would be National Year of Indigenous People. So Oren Lyons came to the exhibit and he asked me what was going to happen to the sculpture afterwards. I said, oh, we're just going to tear it down and 
He goes, oh, no, you shouldn't do that. You should try and save it. Right. And, uh, you know, when somebody like that says something like that, I really try to listen and to honor it. So from that moment, we tried to save it. We had to cut it into pieces so that it would fit through the door. And then it was assembled again at this small cultural center in uh, the border with Canada, Niagara Falls, mm. in a small community center there that was run by, well, within the larger community center, there was a Native American organization that Alan Jamieson ran. And we brought the sculpture there. So the sculpture was exhibited in a former classroom of this high school building that had now become the Niagara Cultural Arts Center. And we had to fit it through the window so the sculpture had to be further cut into pieces and then reassembled inside. Wow. And Alan's son helped me do that. And um, so then there was the first time that the sculpture was fully freestanding and had a back. The um, skin parts were still rendered in clay, but the clay had, had dried and shrunk. So it had these very dramatic fissures, you know. Mm -hmm. And Dennis Banks was one of the founders of the American Indian Movement, came to the school and saw the sculpture. So that I'm here in, you know, in California and I get an email from Alan and there's Dennis Banks standing in front of the statue. I was like, oh my God. So then from then on, I just kind of sensed the responsibility that I should try and keep this um, portrait alive and, you know, campaigned and got some support from friends and acquaintances. And I that I was able to make the version that now exists that's made out of redwood and um, foam and epoxy and steel. It's mm. still not a permanent version of the statue, but it's a bit more durable withstanding the elements you know well that's interesting i'm i'm not sure we need to go deeply into this but of course i'm wondering well what would constitute a what's your vision for a more permanent version of the statue a different material so that it could be somewhere and withstand the elements yes yes so my my dream vision for it is that the sculpture would be rendered in stone and and tile yeah. And that it could exist somewhere there near Wounded Knee, where um, the events that led to Leonard's incarceration happened. Right. And that it could be, you know, just a small part of contributing to a small economy of um, tourists, you know, people that visit that area who are already sensitized to the relevance of the site. And that usually there's a small parking lot there where locals sell crafts and things like that to visitors. And I imagine if there was a big sculpture, a statue there, there was a bit of a landmark that most likely would generate the synergies where people could then be coexisting with it and selling their own artwork, their own crafts, their own way of preserving that memory and keeping that momentum going forward because as we know the the demands and concerns that they have are not they don't have an expiration date and they're ongoing but it has to do with safeguarding their culture but also you know mother earth environment all of that that's a beautiful thought the one thing though that's fascinating about the statue and the version that it is now is that it's been so many places and so many people have been able to interact with it. So if you're tired of telling the story of what happened with this statue when it was here in Oakland, you don't have to. And I can just give a little preamble before we come on. I can try and sum it up. Um, okay. Yeah. As you mentioned, like not only has the sculpture been um, several places, but then the feet of the sculpture have kind of taken a life of their own and been in even more places and then all there's a great number of people that have stood on the feet as a way of um, communing with uh, with Leonard sort of as if the feet were broadcasting device broadcasting station from 
send their good wishes and their positive energies to Leonard and also try to feel unquote, what it would be to walk on his shoes. Mm. So that has happened, and you know, people including you know, Angela Davis and Leonard Crowdog, some very distinguished and esteemed leaders, as well as people that I don't know their names. And um, at the last place that the sculpture was exhibited at, as such, was at the Richmond Art Center in the Bay Area. And Roberto Martinez was the a young curator who had just started working there. He offered to help transport the statue back to Los Angeles, where I live, so that I could keep safeguarding it, storing it. They kept it at the Richmond Art Center for basically as long as they could, as long as it felt safe there. And uh, Roberto, out of the kindness of his heart, offered to, instead of taking his own car to come visit his family over Christmas and New Year, he said he would drive the U-Haul and then fly back. And in the process of doing that, he loaded the sculpture onto the U-Haul. And just for logistical ease, instead of leaving the U-Haul parked by the Richmond Art Center, where it might have been safer, he parked it near where he lives. Mm-hmm in Oakland, downtown Oakland, and got up the next morning with his girlfriend. They were going to drive together, six in the morning, and he walked to where he had left the truck, and the truck was simply not there anymore. So, you know, I texted Roberto, hey, is everything okay? He's like, actually, not really. And, uh, yeah, so, it, you know, it's very stressful. He was riding his bicycle all over Oakland. Michelle is looking on social media see if anybody might be any sightings of it and to our surprise they found that this woman Oakland resident posted on her Facebook that she had seen the truck because there was an oh sorry let me backtrack there because the intent of the sculpture as we've talked before of the statue is to contribute to call attention to Leonard's continued imprisonment Mm -hmm. and his continued um, separation from his family and his loved ones He's now been there 47 years. He's in his late 70s. Wow. There's absolutely no reason, humane, legal. There's no reason whatsoever that he should continue in prison for another day. So any chance we can, we try and call attention to this continued plight. So when the statue got stolen, i.e. the U-Haul truck got stolen with the statue in it, Roberto and I got together, thought about it. It's like, well, let's use this opportunity to call attention to what to Leonard, you know. So he contacted Channel 2 there in the Bay Area, and they were quite moved by the story. They came to speak with him, and he asked them, you know, do you know about out here? Oh, no, not really. So he provided them with a thumb drive with all this, like information about the case and information about the sculpture and they actually did a remarkable news item on the fact that the, that the statue had been stolen without using any degrading or further um, penalizing language towards Leonard you know they described as a statue of a Native American activist that the statue was beloved and so it was um, a nice news article and Brandy, Brandy, this um, woman, she saw it on the news and she took a note of the license plate of the haul truck and she was walking around her neighborhood and she saw a big U-Haul truck that she thought fit the description and then she went to see the license plate and it, she called her husband, yeah, go see the printed version of the article because I think this might be it. And he in fact confirmed that it was the right license plate. And in the middle of this process, it turns out there were people inside the truck. Wow. And when she went around to see the front of the truck, there was people in it and the truck took off. And she's in her 70s herself, I think late 70s. And she started literally running after this 26-foot U-Haul truck through downtown Oakland while she's on the phone with their husband and on the phone with the Oakland Police Department. Anyway, so that that's kind of how the 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 truck was found was because of um 
you know, the dedication of this person that felt strongly about Leonard's case, you know, one of those veteran activists that the Bay Area has so many of, thankfully. Right. I just looked up on Instagram and her name you have there is Darby. Darby. I knew I was saying it wrong. My apologies. Darby. Brady. I, I... But you have this wonderful photo of her standing on the feet from this statue. Right. So on her Facebook posts, there's a way of getting back to her, right? So Michelle, Roberta's companion, she, I said, could you reach out to her? Maybe she would be, you know willing to come because once the u-haul truck was found we had to move the contents from that u-haul truck to another u-haul truck because that one was not in working order anymore yeah and to still try and bring the statue down it, the, it took about a week to find the truck so they called darby late night to say oh next morning we're going to be moving the statue from one U-Haul truck to the next with you, might you be willing or able to come by? Because if you did, the artist would love to have your photo taken on the feet of the statue. And so she did, and she brought her husband along. And this is really this beautiful photographs of the two of them taking turns on the feet of the statue. And she actually called me. She was like, hey, is this Rigo? <laughs> this is Darby. I'm standing on the feet of the statue right now. <laughs> wow. So she called me while standing on the feet. It was just, um, I couldn't think of a better, um, in a way, um, because w we know that, le you know, in terms of the justice system, for lack of a better word, that's keeping Leonard imprisoned, is guilty. Is guilty of aiding and abetting. Two individuals who were acquitted on the basis of self-defense, which boggles the mind. But that's what he's, what he's guilty of. Right. Aiding and abetting two individuals who were... Who were found not to have committed the crime that he supposedly aided and abetted them on. Correctly. So, but out there, in the court of public opinion, you know, what they like to call hearts and minds, Leonard is not guilty. You know, it's... Right. Uh, American United States federal government establishment that is guilty of this continued disregard and undervaluing of indigenous life in this territory that they usurped. So it was remarkable to see that this one news article comes out in on a local station in the Bay Area and causes a 70 some cause an elder, you know, female elder to like forget about our own safety or physical limitations and become some kind of superhero right. chasing a U-Haul truck through downtown Oakland. Um, so I thought it was like, that's what society thinks of, of Leonard. Right. Uh, and, and, and the police officer that came to, the, to take note of the occurrence, he would be described, I guess, as a white police officer. And he told Roberto that his beat partner was native. And that when he heard that this thing had been stolen, he was determined to find it. Mm. Partially, it's like on behalf of his partner, you know? Right. So here you have in a city where the relationship between the police department and the population is so tense. And there's so many grievances that even a police officer, Oakland police officer, felt or knew that by helping finding this sculpture, that his beat partner, who's native, would have a higher appreciation of him, you know? Right, right. So it was from this random citizen to a member of the police department. That's how they reacted upon the news, upon knowing that this statue had been inadvertently, I think, stolen. Right, right. Well, you know, though, there's a little coda to this story as well that is one of the things that I haven't really synthesized yet, but that I kind of chew over a lot in that you found the statue, but the hand was missing. And then a few days later, the hand was spotted in front of an encampment for of someone who was unhoused. And Correct. you're talking about these elements of Oakland, and we have such an enormous unhoused population who struggle to create some sense of home, whether it's 
They sometimes, you know, there have been these amazingly well organized communities that spring up, you know, of tents and tarps and all kinds of things built. There are other people who are maybe living in some sort of barely functioning RV or something, but there just seemed to be something so poignant about the hand winding up in front of this encampment for people who are unhoused. And that really just made me feel like it was one other gesture of like, you know, don't forget about this portion of the community in Oakland. Interesting. Yes, as if the arm was pointing at them, even the dismembered arm was pointing yes. at that situation. It's true. Yeah. And it was someone else that saw it. Someone else spotted the arm, took a photograph from their car. They were at a quote-unquote safe distance, I guess, by their estimation. And then they put a big red circle on what they saw was the was they thought what could be the arm of the statue. And there was a dog standing on it. Wow. And, you know, it made me think of uh, Charles Mingus' autobiography, Beneath the Underdog, that here was the arm of Leonard's statue, as you say, adorning or next to a unhoused person's dwelling, and their security guard slash dog was standing on the arm. <laughs> right. Well, if you knew nothing about this story and you came across that arm, I, I mean, I'm going to include photos of this statue, but it's so incredibly, I don't know, the, you said it's redwood that you used to carve it out of? Right, because of the, you know, connotation with the redness and because uh, my I, my contacts here in California, I have also a long-term relationship with three um, cultural groups that live along the Klamath River, Karuk, Yurak, and, and Hupa tribes. And so I spoke with them and sort of got their acquiescence, their blessing, as it were, to do that. So Leonard was carved in California out of redwood tree. Yeah. Just the way that that hand looks. If I were walking along and I found it and I knew absolutely nothing about this story, I would take it home too because it would feel like some incredible treasure that fell like out of the heavens, like this beautiful human hand, but made out of this California redwood. It's, I just imagine even finding that and feeling the power in that hand in a certain way. Right. No, I'm nodding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the whole story just captured my imagination in such a way that I just couldn't let it go. And as you know, I reached out and we've been trying to schedule many times. And I'm so happy that you've made time to talk about this. But I do have one more question about ideas of collaboration that goes beyond what we might ordinarily imagine it to be, and especially collaborations with people who are being held behind bars. How do you think this can break down divisions that we normally put up? Like someone else on the inside, but I'm on the outside. You know, like how do we, how does this what what do you feel about this type of collaboration and right I, I think that you know so many of the systemic structural problems that we've inherited and are still inhabiting is this artificial you know separation that is made among people you know mm -hmm. based on color of their skin based on their ideas of how the world began you know which were the divining gods that created this unfathomable experience that we share right. um, from who they love, you know, what, their, what gender they identify with. There's always been uh, forces, structural forces, and individuals really bent on creating categories that separate us, you know. Mm -hmm. And I really believe otherwise. I believe that at the spiritual level, we can, we can find common you know the common thread 
amongst all of us, regardless of the number of legs that we have, regardless of, you know, for a vegetable or an animal and so on and so forth. And um, in prison, where, you know, they have to find, they have to devise forms of currency that apply. And of course, you know, brutality and force and all of those systems of exchange and, and of setting up hierarchy exist in prison as well as outside and maybe even more viciously so. But there's also trust, you know, and word, like having word is so key to the stature that individuals can acquire in prison. And this possibility of like corresponding with someone where you're trying to pour your best uh, pour your heart, as it were, on the page, and then you wait, and a week later, two weeks later, a letter arrives, and there's a reply to that. And yeah, my experience was, I just, you know, I I had never gotten a, a sense of such joy. Like when I first got a letter from Geronimo, it was addressed, Nduguru Rigo, it was a, you know, I had to ask him what that meant, it was a Swahili greeting. Ah. And, um, you know, with the typewriter and all that, so you can see the each letter right. is marked on the paper. So I think it is yeah, my experience um, with corresponding or collaborating with people who are in the position of being incarcerated. It is the incarcerated that leads the process, you know, that says what can, cannot happen, what should, shouldn't happen and so on and so forth that that possibility of of trust and of co anything right co speaking collaborating co feeling co loving co envisioning all of those as you might have seen there at uh, Anglin Twimble in one Albert Woodfox and uh, Albert and, and Herman sent me a happy birthday card you know this is something that i had nearly forgotten and I'm going through my papers, I found it like, oh my God, it was, you know, they send a happy birthday card from prison, which means that they had to circulate the envelope from cell to cell. Wow. And in it, Albert said, um, distance only means that love and friendship have to travel faster. And when I reread it, he was no longer in, in this realm, you know, he was no longer... <laughs> alive so to see that it was just you know a punch to the gut yeah like how just yeah we have the internet and we have instant messaging and we have so many ways of trying to erase distance via technology but more often than not they become very quickly become a burden you know you're getting all this message you didn't want you get <laughs> all this publicity you know and to read that affirmed from where it was affirmed, you know, and the conditions that it where that uh, feeling was expressed from is just anyway, yeah. So um, I basically I, I recommend if if people want to try and have a different kind of relationship with the communication of a distance that they they find an individual man or woman that might be incarcerated for the wrong reasons, and it's. It's of course questionable what whether anyone is incarcerated for the right reasons. Is is you know many people question whether that form of punishment is in fact productive in terms of correcting wrongs. Mm -hmm. But um, I, you know, I encourage people to um, reach out, you know, and write. Right. Yeah, my oldest daughter actually had a pen pal who was in prison. Uh -huh. I think he's out now, but wow. yeah, and it is really true. His letters to her were so full of advice and, you know, encouraging her in her life, which I just thought, wow, it's so incredibly generous of that person to be writing someone who is quote unquote on the outside and encouraging them. Yeah, it reawakens you in a way, right? Because it's it's so surprising, you know, that that would be the energy you would receive. Right. That it can, yeah, it can, times can can shake us out of our quotidian 
state, right? Of everything being more or less expectable, short of like some disaster. Yeah. Well, this has been so amazing to talk to you. And I'm wondering if you want to share with people who are listening where they can find out more about you and your work. So, you know, I have a limited presence in terms of social media and things like that. But about a year or a couple of years ago, I started an Instagram account, which is at Rigo 23 Studio. So I don't post super often, but I'm trying to use that more as a tool to communicate with people and to be available for people to communicate with me. You know, I also use email, which is rigo23studio at gmail.com. Right. And I want to encourage people just to Google you because in preparing to reach out to you, that's what I did. And there are so many amazing interviews of you in different publications and so many opportunities to look at your work online as well. True. There are some things up there. <laughs> and like, yeah, I don't take these things lightly. I really appreciated you reaching out to me because I, you know, I suspect that when people do that, that they are moved by the right reasons because there's not many wrong reasons to reach out to me. <laughs> That's great. Well, Rigo, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you as well, Pam. And I love the title of your podcast. Oh, thank I you. didn't touch upon that, but I think that was foundational <laughs> to our conversation that art can have that power of healing, divisions, trauma, mistrusts, <laughs> you know, many things like that. So appreciate you for all that you do and for reaching out. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. Many thanks to Rico23 for having this conversation with me. It really felt cathartic. I was able to attend a presentation with Rico23 and Robert King of the Angola 3, who is creating a center in the community of Algiers in New Orleans. I'll include a link to the show February 31st in the show notes, and you can see examples of some of these collaborations that Rico23 created with the Angola 3. And maybe, if you're curious, learn more about Robert King and the center he has planned. Thank you so much for joining me and listening to Rigo 23's story. Let me know how you liked the episode by either reaching out on social media or through my website, arthealsallwoundspodcast.com. The music you've heard in this podcast is by Ketza and Lobo Loco. This podcast was edited by Eva Hristova. Art Heals All Wounds comes to you from Oakland, California, on unceded territory of the Chokenyo Ohlone people.